Although the you know the perspective is very different. The idea, uh, if you're downed in your in your fighter jet, and we do fly fighters, is to survive until rescue. Uh, but nevertheless, I you know I felt more than uh, comfortable comfortable with, with the skills that I had. That yeah, well, you're very fortunate to uh, have started that early and and uh, uh, to have uh, had uh, some coaching there by uh, Paul Petzl, who Chris was one of the co-founders of the Exum Mountain yep. Guides, the oldest. Uh, school in the country in Jackson Hole. I uh, hope to meet Paul someday and uh, get him in front of one of my cameras. I'm sure he'd enjoy that. So then, uh, but you are you doing uh, trying to do the uh, uh, 14,000 peaks in Colorado, or just going to Colorado? And I just I just climb because I love it. Yeah, you're not you're that's not one of your yeah, goals. No. Yeah, like the so. the, uh, the others who have that have that objective. What? One of the, uh, obviously going to space, you know, is the, the best perk in the astronaut job. Uh, one of the downsides is that you spend a lot of time training, and when you're assigned to a mission, uh, going mountaineering or, or a lot of different very active sports that have the potential for harm uh, are really not a good idea to, to pursue. And so while I was a graduate student, I had dreams of, you know, doing a lot of climbs, uh, and, I, and I'd still like to do a high peak, an 8,000 meter peak sometime. I think some of the more serious projects will have to wait until I'm no longer an astronaut. What's your, uh, well, in, in terms of your climbing goals, do you have, are you just going, flying up to Colorado mostly now? Or, yeah. Uh, and haven't tried some of the places in Texas? Uh, Texas actually has some good climbing spots. Waco Tanks and uh, in the wintertime is a good place to climb. Uh, the, the best news is that about 15 minutes from my house they opened an indoor climbing gym. Yeah. So at least I can enjoy some of the camaraderie, and you know we have a group of guys that are going over there now. And your skills, pretty yeah. regularly. And, and yeah, I know uh, uh, Todd uh, Skinner was in uh, Washington about a year ago for a National Geographic lecture, and was talking about uh, he uh, he was at that time living in uh, uh, somewhere down I think around El Paso, training mm -hmm. for his next adventure, having just come off of a Nameless Tower and lost a lot of muscle mass mm -hmm. weight because yeah. they were there so long. Yeah. Um, the, what's, what is your next uh, uh, program in, uh, with NASA? Well, for me, the... Uh, you cycle... You know, I'm, astronauts are very goal-oriented, and the current flight rate is about, you get an opportunity to fly about once every two or two and a half years. And I'm really looking forward to building the International Space Station. And for, from a personal side, I want to do spacewalks. We call it extravehicular activity. Mm -hmm. But when you're in your spacesuit, uh, you're your own self-contained spaceship, essentially. Uh, going outside of the, the space shuttle or outside of the space station in a spacesuit, and it's very much like winter mountaineering. You have a big backpack on, a lot of lay multi layers, uh, big thick gloves, helmet. So, uh, I think that's going to be the greatest adventure for me from space flight. Were you uh, the latest uh, exercise where the two astronauts went out to recapture the satellite that they had mm -hmm. re previously released? was a very dangerous assignment, and they were practic practicing that in a pool. Was that in Houston? Yeah, that was in Houston. All, all the astronaut training is done in Houston. And in order to simulate weightlessness, we go into our spacesuits and go underwater. And I do that pretty frequently. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's just, you know, if you put your brain just in the right place when you're underwater, uh, you can have a pretty good feeling of what it's going to be like to be out in space doing this. This is scuba gear, gear? Actually, it's in a spacesuit. Space suit? Uh, in the in a underwater modified version of the same spacesuit. Uh -huh. There are a lot of other people in scuba underwater, you know, holding umbilicals and, and doing support and safety. But uh, we're still in our real spacesuits pressurized the way we would be. Oh, I see. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, I, I did see some uh, footage on television, and I probably should have noticed that. But uh, I, I guess that I didn't uh, realize uh, exactly how that was done. But that was quite a coup I guess, yeah. for the, those two guys. So it was a good thing. Actually, you know, as far as the danger element, uh, I think that was a pretty safe satellite capture. You know, it was very dramatic, uh, but we've handled very heavy things in space before. We've captured, uh, you know, 15,000 pound satellites uh, before. And of when, did, when did it have to be brought back as opposed to reorienting and, and pushing it out the door again? Uh, the onboard computers had already shut down. And the way, it, just the peculiarities of this particular satellite, 
there's some switches in the bottom of the satellite and you have to actually put it back in the payload bay to reset it. It's not a, a truly smart satellite. Uh, so once it's back in the payload bay, inside you can type commands and send commands back to the satellite to get it going again. And we put a lot of discussion into redeploying it later in the mission. And it was actually the principal investigators, uh, the people who built the satellite, who decided they didn't want to risk flying it again on this mission. They wanted to get it back, refurbish it, and try for another mission. When will the first elements of the space station be sent up? We have a timetable? We have a timetable, and we're hoping to stick to it. It's looking still pretty promising, but June of next year, 1998, the Russians will launch the FGB, the Functional Energy Block, which will be the, the first element, and it's a control post uh, for the space station. And the next month, in July, we're going to launch Node 1, which is the centerpiece. It's where all the other pieces attach. Uh, and at that point, we can truly call it a space station. In December, we're going to launch the service module, which is another Russian piece of hardware. The, the FGB and the service mo module are Russian. The node is, is US. And after that, we can put people on board. So early 1999, the first uh, multinational crew will go up. Are these elements going in the shuttle? The node will go in the shuttle. The Russian parts go up on Soyuz rockets or on proton rockets, Russian rockets. And then will have to be captured or docked with? Yes. The, the, Russian, the first piece will, will be in orbit. The shuttle will rendezvous with it and attach the a part. Then the service module will come up and it will automatically rendezvous and dock. And then after that, the shuttle will come back and put some other pieces and some solar arrays. And bit by bit, over about uh, two and a half years, we'll assemble a, a very large space station. I went to Washington in the era, because of the space program in, uh, in the early 60s, in the era when the astronauts were our great PR people. Or I don't see you folks being used uh, so much that way. Maybe it's because we're used to it, but are you still doing uh, uh, sort of PR activities to gain support for the funding? Uh, Actually, the, the entire environment of Washington, as you know, has changed since the 60s. Yes. In terms of <laughs> what, what government agencies can do to lobby uh, for their own causes. In right. fact, it's now illegal. Um, right. I can't go to Congress and ask them for money on behalf of NASA. But you That's can go on Good Morning America. What We can go on Good Morning. I can talk to you. More importantly, we've transitioned uh, the PR aspects of the space program from being uh, spokesmen to try and garner support for the space program. I think the American people are very much behind the space program. To try and inform and give back to the American people uh, accounts of our expeditions. And that's, that's great. I think that's the right answer. I mean, the, you know, the, the cost American benefit people ratio. pay us to, to go fly in space, and we just happen to be the lucky ones to sit on the pointy end of the rocket. And I have the opportunity then to go back and tell people what it's like, give slideshows, uh, very much like I did you know, from Chicago Mountaineering Club, coming back and you know, talking about going on some expedition. Now I get to talk about going to space. So you, you do have an, uh, sort of a speaker's bureau or an active yeah. program to go it's, out? It's actually in our job description to go out once a month and talk to schools and community groups. Oh, okay. And so we do that, and I enjoy it. I, you know, I used to teach at Caltech a little bit and uh, had students, and so I enjoy that relationship. That does, so that does sound like fun. So that will prepare you for when you have uh, done your uh, big mountains and you can come back and come to AAC and do your slideshow. That's right. Like yep. Ed Best years. Well, John, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to come up today. And uh, on behalf of ever, all Americans and AAC members, uh, good luck on your career as an astronaut. And I hope you make those big mountains someday. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's been great talking to you.